I think that's, I mean, that's probably the best advice to anybody out there is like, dude, look at the small stuff. Watch Mick. Look, you don't look at his turn. Look at where he's looking as he enters his turn. Look where his chest is facing as he finishes his turn. Look how he transitions out of that turn. It's all these little intricate details, hand placement, breathing, everything. Like, look at the little stuff. guest for this episode is Adam Knox. Adam is a former pro surfer and is currently working as a surf coach in Carlsbad in Southern California. Adam is one of the best surf coaches I have personally worked with so it is my absolute pleasure to bring you this interview. Adam shares his story, his experiences and of course plenty of surfing tips. Give him a follow on Instagram at Adam underscore Knox. From this area? No, I'm from uh, I'm from Ojai, California. So it's like inland Rincon, like 15 minutes. But also Sage Erickson's from Ojai. The Malloy brothers, they worked for my mom at the Ojai Valley Inn, like way back in the day, like when they're in high school. I'm trying to think who else is from kind of inland. Maybe that's about it. Me, Sage, and the Malloys. Ojai is close to Ventura. Yeah, it's, so it's inland. It's a valley, and it just, it's, like, super spiritual, like I was saying, like, that, that fire that you guys had um, in Malibu. Like, that one, you know, reached Ojai as well with the Santa Anas, and it has big mountains. Like, there's probably snow all over them right now. Um, but that fire came down and literally made a perfect circle around there where it usually would burn, like, foothills and stuff like that. And then it just stopped. And I think I'm I'm giving it up to, like, the wizards and all the uh, – all the um, – crystals and stuff you'll see around here that (laughs) that, you know you grew up there you're just kind of weird like that you know yeah did you start surfing there um i started surfing so my brother micah was a surfer um taylor had already moved so taylor moved so it's i'm the youngest then nine years above me is micah um my brother i grew up with and then taylor is 14 years older so i remember going down to like the bud wiser um you remember like the bud pro like that was like the qs back then so remember him, there was there was one at c street i remember being like literally there's a photo i remember it though too because taylor gives these hugs that like crush you <laughs> especially when you're a little there's a couple times where like you know when your spine gets separated and i'm like crying and then my brother mike is like dude don't be lame man like I don't like to you know, I just got my back broken. <laughs> I'm not trying to cry right now, man. <laughs> I'm freaking six. But uh, anyways, he got out of this heat and gave me a hug, and I, and I remember that. But that was what you qualified on. It was a Bud Surf Tour. And it was like, it was, I don't, you know, not, not to take away from any of those guys, but it was nothing like, you know, it was, there was a California tour, you know, that you could qualify on, I believe, right? But yeah, no, I didn't, I was, my brother was already famous by the time I was like, you know, in sixth grade seventh grade for sure so i i rode dirt bikes and i raced bmx like and i skated i wanted nothing to do with surfing and then i kind of did a little bit and i was longboarding and you know i got good at that when i moved to carlsbad they threw me on the surf team just because of my brother you know this guy danny cooper how old were you then uh i was in eighth grade so and so taylor moved from oxnard shores here in eighth grade as well which is kind of a weird coincidence you know you know, 14 years later, you know, I guess, or maybe longer. I don't know. I'm not good with math, but, um, they threw me into a contest and, uh, I made the final, but then it got big. It got big at Pono. And like, it went from like four feet to where I was winning all my heats and it got really big and no one really made it out for this. One of my friends from the big island, who's still a charger. He lives on the North shore now, Nick McRae, but, um, he won the contest because he's the only guy that made it out the back. It was one of those things, you know? So got six in my first final. And then that just kind of, it just kind of snowballed, you know, I just kept doing it. and That lit the fire? Yeah, it kind of it kind of lit the fire. I mean, I, I'm i kind of a weird, a weird surfer when it comes to that stuff. It's like, at that point, it was fun, you know? And, uh, but I was so behind, like, the eight ball. Like, I, I was, I'm the same age as Dane Reynolds. I'm the same age as, like, uh, the Godowskis, you know, the, um, Dane and um, Pat. And uh, those guys are already really good and sponsored and stuff. I didn't get good until, like, 16, and I didn't start winning like pro junior stuff like our circuit around here. Um, I think I finaled and and 
you know, in the top two or three in every contest in the San Diego, you know, Monster Pro Juniors and all that stuff. And then the last contest, I lost out first round, and those are usually like, you know, double rated or triple rated. And I went from first to third in the very end, but I almost won the series and that kind of stuff. But that, that set me up. And But really, I was more of a, a photo guy. Like I was in – it wanted to be a magazine where I didn't have a, like a two-page spread or um, or multiple shots. And then the surf shot was on, so that was like a local mag, but it was pretty big. So I was in all that stuff. So, so Jet Pilot was just like – you know, they're a wakeboard company, but they had a small surf team, but they were like one of the biggest wakeboarding companies from Australia, you know, and Japan. They're like, dude, just do the photo thing. And then that's when photo stuff was cool and you could survive that way. But, um, but it changed. So I went like, what, five, six years, like, oh, all right, yeah, do you getting like some, you know, getting salary, but then getting like a $9,000 check for being in five magazines that, that month, you know, going, oh, you know, and then after that, like, I was like, oh, dude, this is easy. You know, I just got to like do it half ass and and do the photos and all that stuff and go have fun and party and all that stuff. And that's when you start to lose the plot, you know. So I've kind of done all the, did some of the right things, you know. And if you look at the, if you read some of the articles, like, you know, Adam's work ethic is really good. Because on a trip, I'll be super just focused until the job's done. And then last day we'll go out or whatever. But uh, I've had a few photographers kind of like get, get bummed that I didn't want to hang and do all this stuff. Um, Billy Watts, for instance, who was a, you know, very known photographer now. He's like, dude, you know, I didn't like Adam on this trip. Like <laughs> he was kind of, you know, unsocial and, you know, he didn't want to, he said he didn't want to go see the monkeys and we were in Costa Rica. The waves were flat and we weren't getting anything done. And then when he came back and sold all the shots, he realized, and he wrote a thing in Mundo Rad, like an article, and he talks about how he didn't like me, and then he realized, okay, he was trying to make money and do, you know, do stuff for his sponsors, so. Yeah. Okay. So you're quite a late bloomer. Yeah, dude, full on. And and that's and that's one of the things is, like, um, with a lot of these guys, like, say, my brother or um, – a lot of the older guys and the pros, they'll, they'll, they'll write guys off really quick. Like, oh, he's not going to make it because of this. And then I'm like, well, dude, and not that I, like, made it, made it, but I had 11 years of salary where I'd never had to work, you know, um, where I could have done a lot better, where, you know, the things I did is what messed it up. It wasn't because I bloomed late, you know. And maybe that's what they're talking about, but I think I think there's a, ch- you know, a chance. I know it's changed a bit. Like, dude, guys can come up. I mean, there's some guys out there that are really good that don't have the, really the financial backing, but if they find it, they could they could be world tour guys, you know? So once you did that first comp and you kind of realized, oh, hey, I'm actually okay at this, I could maybe get good enough to be paid, did you seek coaching? I mean, how did you get to that next Dude, level? no, you know what? I mean, I had a coach before that for just a little bit, and he was the worst. I'm not going to say the name and <laughs> all that stuff, but he really just surfed. And, and, you know, that was it. And it was, like, super early. And I'm not super morning person. It was, like, you know, you know, dawn before he had to go to work. And it was all about him and all that stuff. And so you got to watch out for those coaches with, with all the ego. You know, you got to become pretty selfless. And then you got to, you know, really get into the psyche of, of these guys, you know, which makes you get close to them and stuff. But we'll get into that. But, um, no, I didn't get a coach. I just uh, – I changed my board sponsor and that helped helped a lot. I went over to this guy Dan Taylor from Newport. I don't know if you know of him, but um, those boards worked really good. And that was during like the uh, the pro junior stuff and really turned it on. Yeah, no, I mean, I just kind of figured it out. I call them clicks, you know, like when I'm coaching guys and I just started clicking, you know, like I just you can call it leveling up or whatever. But I just kept doing it over and over again, and I was pretty focused on that stuff. So, what a practical example? What you you did a turn that was a little faster than your usual turns and you remembered it and you thought, I want that feeling again. Yeah. It, it's, you know, I'm kind of a, you know, my brother sits into all his turns and all that kind of stuff where I'm more kind of like, um, have more like spontaneity, you know, like, um, you know, so I think what it was is, uh, I, I, you know, I got, I got good at airs. I was also really aggressive into the lip, you know? So like right when I, when I stand up, I'm on like, and some guys will say I do too much, which is, a valid point, but it gets the job done too, you know? So if I, I just want to get up into that lip and, you know, I can, I'll do like, you know, a lot of photographers, I just posted a little thing on my Instagram. A lot of my shots, dude, my head or my hands cut off of my airs because they don't you know. They don't think I'm going to do that. You know, they, it looks like I'm going to do something else. I do something else on it. So it's, I think that's kind of cool, but yeah, I just, 
that was one of the things. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. Chris Malloy told my brother Micah, like, and I remember the day exactly. It was a perfect day in Ventura, and it was air sections. And I was surfing with some of my buddies, my best friend Jameson Kane, who's a smoke jumper in Alaska. And uh, I was surfing good, and Chris was just down the way. But he went and told my brother Micah, he's like, dude, I saw your brother surfing, and I've never heard of him, and I should have heard of him. And that was when I was like 17 or 18. And Micah was like, dude, I don't want to tell you. Your head's going to blow up. But somebody said something. I'm like, dude, just tell me. Just tell me. And it turns out, like, I look up to Chris Malloy probably more than most because you, you know where you stand with him, you know? There's no gray area. There's no, like, tricks or something, you know? Like, he's just a solid dude. And, uh, you know, my brother Taylor would tell you the same thing. But um, coming from him, that's that was huge. And maybe it did blow my head up or something. I don't know. But <laughs> So that inspired you? Yeah, dude, it inspired me for sure. It just it just showed me that I was that I was doing my job right, you know. For have a you know living legend, you know, to me, say something like that was huge. But right, you know, at that point, I was really just just excelling, you know. So yeah, yeah. And did you have during that time where you were on a salary? Did you have a coach at all? Like, did you have a good coach? No, dude, and I I wish I did. You know, I I wish I had more than just a coach. I wish I had a mentor because there was a lot of things I could have done better, you know, in hindsight, you know, stay in, you know, like, you know, don't don't go out, you know, worry about chicks later, you know, and I I tell my guys this now, like, it's like, you know, party, party after you've already won, you know, like, Really, there's nothing to party for. Yeah, it's cool to live your life, have some fun, for sure. But we almost took it to the extreme. But that's how it kind of was back then, you know. Like you'll hear, you'll you'll hear Mick and all those guys say it was pretty easy to beat people out of, you know, out at uh, you know, Dawn Patrol at Bell's because everyone was hungover all the time, you know. So we grew up watching those guys, and like those lost videos. So we're like, we just implemented it. Okay, this is how it is. We've kind of made it, so we can kind of do that, which we never really made it. Like I was a I was a C surfer, you know, like that had the potential. Like a lot of guys were like, dude, you're going to be better. You know, you're going to be better than all that, you know, because I can kind of just, you know, play. I can get on a dirt bike. I can do it, you know, that kind of stuff. But, um, so you're naturally sort of, you find all sports easier than most people. It, it, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I can't talk for everybody else, but yeah, I, I mean, I can, yeah, I've always been kind of a, into everything you know like good at everything but never a master at anything you know which where my brother you know drive beats talent every time mm. so have you have you done quite a, um what motocross or trail riding or yeah what? well I, I did the race around the lake um uh, my friend shane Trittler does and that's that's my friend that malibu that is out in mojave desert right now but um he's a he's like a but when you were, when you were younger and before you sort of won that first comp Instead of surfing, you were. I'd go up to Ballinger, so I'd take the 33 out of Ojai, and I'd <laughs> I get car sick, so I'd throw up on the way there, and I'd throw up on the way back, but I'd have a great time when I got there. <laughs> yeah, I just rode dirt bikes, you know. I grew, we grew up pretty poor, but um, my mom figured out a way to, you know, I don't know, credit cards or whatever, but to get me things. So I was like the only kid out of like my poor friends that had a dirt bike, so I had to go ride by myself all the time or bring somebody, and they'd just crash my bikes all the time and do all that but um yeah no like i'd just race bmx and i'd just do it all by myself literally what were you seeking then i have no idea Dire- direction <laughs> i don't know like just the thrill of the jump on the bike and yeah the speed dude. and yeah i love um I, well for me it, it's it's pretty rad because you can it's it's unlike surfing surfing is the hardest sport in the world where dirt bike riding you go out there you can redo it and i mean Physically, I think dirt bike riding is the hardest sport in the world. So, um, to to go do those motos and be, I mean, their cardio is jacked and their grip strength and everything, you know, adductors and their legs. I mean, just all that stuff. But I mean, I'll, I'll look on YouTube and see some trick tips and I can go implement them and I can get better in a day, which I think was rad, but I just love dirt bikes. It was just something I was just obsessed with when I was a kid, you know? Yeah. So you were very self driven to learn dirt bike tricks yeah dude 100% and I like to jump more than do everything else but I went and did this race and I shouldn't have like Shane Trittler is an ex-pro and he has like a board out 450 YZ 450 and um, they told me to come out and race and all this stuff and he's so busy because it's his event that, my, that his bike I was going to ride didn't have gas I didn't walk the track 
I didn't um I didn't get to do anything you're supposed to do, right? And like I literally got gas like five minutes before the heat and I got on this line with like two hundred people and I was revving it up and all this stuff and I'm like <laughs> trying to like calm myself down so I looked to the guy on my right, I'm like, What's up man? Like trying to make friends and they're just kinda of dogging me and I looked to my left, I'm like, You ever done this before? And he's like, What man? Like I'm like, Okay and I just break away and I get the whole shot and uh, you know, first turn, second turn, and then everyone backed off on the third turn. And I was like, Oh dude, I'm gonna win this thing. Like, I got this and uh and you you know you get better and you settle in after a while and your arm pump goes away and um everyone everyone sat back because there's there was soot on turn three, which is like it it's like four foot deep powder, like talcum powder that looks like hard ground. And I came into it hot and you feather your front brake to like to bank and my front wheel washed out, dude. And I I was probably going like forty five. And I remember it was left wrist, face, tried to bring my right hand up, couldn't, so it tore my rotator cuff in like four spots, um, broke my left hand, um, my humerus hit my subscapula and fractured the head of it, and um, I, I crawled off, and when you hit the ground that hard, you don't, I don't know if you ever hit the ground that hard or anything like that hard, you have to see, it like takes a few minutes to see if you're going to like die. <laughs> And then your adrenaline is really high, and I, so I didn't really feel it, you know. Like I felt like, oh, I went over there, and I was out, like, knocked the wind out of myself, and all that stuff. But I didn't feel the other stuff. So, and I'm th- looking at the crowd, watching me just eat crap on the third turn at the beginning of the race, and I'm like, you know, I'm only getting starstruck a- around a few, or, you know, I I never met Travis Pastrana, but that's the guy I look up to like the most. Him and like Navy Seals, like those are the craziest people in the world to me. And uh, I've never met Travis, but um, I was like, what would he do? He'd get up. Dude, he crashes. He would crash like 20 times and break his leg in a in a Supercross event and then quadruple a triple and land out in the flats to win. Like, so, <laughs> I don't know. I just got up. And I think I I finished. And this is like beginner, but there's good guys. And you got up back on the bike. Got up. And, I, yeah, I, that was the first lap. I had like eight more miles to go around. Um, got back up, and I finished in the top 10, I think, out of like 60 or something wow. like that. Wow. Yeah. So, but I was like so dazed. And I literally thought that I'd have internal bleeding. I would just die on the bike, <laughs> like no joke. Swear to God. And then after the race, there's a picture of me with like thumbs up, you know, Travis. <laughs> you know? And then I couldn't lift my arm. And then my hand was like it looked like I had a blown up doctor's glove, you know. And uh, I'm like, is this normal? I can't lift my arm. And they're like, oh, dude, you tore your rotator cuff. I'm like, oh way. And the next day, I had to drive stick home, and I drove with like the my forearm so I shift I was shifting with my forearm and I was driving with my forearm like three hours dude just in the worst pain ever and then it took five months I didn't get an MRI for four months because I don't I think they're expensive I didn't have insurance you know and they're like dude it's black in there but you'll be okay in a month and I'm like no way dude it's been five months four months they'll be you're like you'll be okay in a month and uh yeah I don't know wow that's that's an early story yeah it was it was it reminds me of the Denny Way have you seen the anyway when he jumped the great wall of china oh dude um i did see that but i don't know the backstory on that you should watch the doco oh yeah that's sick yeah that's interesting so like at the time like the the race and the thrill of the race was more important than your health yeah i know um it was it wasn't it wasn't the race it was uh for me like it was a really proud moment of myself to be able to take a beating like that and get up and keep going so I really think I'd kind of gotten to the wrong thing. I think I should have been, you know, I should have been in this, you know, tried to be a SEAL or something like that because that's something that I I pride myself in, you know. But you must have had similar experiences in surfing. Yeah, you know what, surfing to me, like, is a bit more scary. Like, so watching the Momentum Generation film and kind of just, no one ever told me, like, okay, you got to go prove yourself in Hawaii. Like, you got to be a pipe and all that stuff. So I kind of like avoided those spots. Like I was, I wasn't a big wave guy at all. I was more like kind of techni- like technical. I wouldn't say technique, but you know, I like to do tricks and that kind of stuff, have fun. And uh, watching that movie and just kind of seeing, you know, for one, seeing where everyone comes kind of from the same place back then, you know, like alcoholic parents, you know, all that stuff. But just listening to that, no one really, you know, put me in a headlock and said, "Dude, you got to do this," you know. And uh, I didn't really get comfortable with big waves until Ricky Whitlock and I went to Spain for Transworld and, and, and we surfed Mundaka and it was like 25 feet 
and we just got I broke my six six first wave standing in giant barrels no handed backside and just broke every single board and just took it now look, there's a picture with me and a broken board Ricky Whitlock is a big wave surfer he's smiling I look like I've seen a ghost and I have a broken board in my hand and there's a lot more to come but at the end of that I was fine you know and uh that's kind of changed me it took it was a little late though you know like I'm all right and big stuff now you know to a, to an extent but back then that was something that that was like an Achilles heel for me for sure you know when you get you get worked when you're a kid it stays with you for a while so that's why I kind of encourage people not to push their kids too hard too soon because that will stay with you I know some pros right now um that uh, when they were kids, they didn't surf big waves. Mason Mason Ho surfed, uh, this, you know, Val's Reef, Val Reef um, inside Sunset more so. When he was a Grom, he didn't really charge, and now look at him. So it's something you can overcome for sure. But it's also something you're born with, but you can overcome it if you try, you know. Yeah, well, extreme um, events tend to either make or break people. It sort of either drives you to get better or makes you realize it's not for me. Yeah. Dude, and for I mean, you, it drove you to get better, right? Yeah, I did, but, I mean, you ever been out the back? I mean, I think Sunset's one of the scarier waves because it's moving mountains, dude, and it's so shifty out there. And Taylor took me out there when it was, I don't know, a solid, like, you know, over 20-foot faces for sure. Hawaiians would probably call it, like, eight or something. But <laughs> but I was out there going, whoa, this is crazy. I don't even know where to sit out here. And it was just, it was big and gnarly, and I uh, I think I ended up paddling in. But I tried to grab, so, you know, there's so many boards in the channel. I tried to save someone's board. And uh, that almost drowned me because I tried to take me over to Cami Land and all that stuff. So I was like, "F this board, I'm freaking to go in and just, you know, take the shame, take the shame of it." <laughs> but I think he, I think he was really trying to prove a point. Like, "Hey, dude, you don't have this big wave stuff, and I'm gonna show you right now." So <laughs> when you were doing motocross when you were younger, before surfing, did that? I'm thinking that maybe that taught you how to get in the zone. Yeah, I mean to a flow state. Yeah, you know what? That's actually probably a good, a good, um, good way to put it, because because you have to be on. That's what. All right. So if with me, all those quick adjustments, they have to be. They have to keep going. Like yeah. I'm good at that. It's when I. It's it's when they, it goes flat. Like when there's that that flat space, then my mind will drift, and then I'll, I've been spacing out for like you know, like a trail ride or something on a dirt bike. Next thing you know, I hit something I didn't wasn't paying attention to. Everything kind of goes blurry. Like I like things that are quick reaction, like martial arts, that kind of stuff. I like that stuff. Um, surfing, for instance. But um, but yeah, that does put you in that that zone. I need that like constant, like crazy, crazy, crazy uh, reflexes, you know. And I have a, I have astigmatism too, so it, I've I've had bad eyes. I was born with it, but my reaction time is good, you know? I think we, we talked about that because you do stuff with vision vision and stuff, right? Yeah. Can you um, just tell folks what astigmatism is? Yeah, so from what I understand, it's um, the astigmatism is like, okay, most eyes are supposed to be shaped spherical, you know, like a basketball. Mine are shaped like footballs. So the light gets re refracted or re I guess not refracted but reflected or like, I don't know what the, you know people you know water yeah, refracts. refraction yeah okay um yeah but it just it just kind of blurs things out like, so say if I were to put my glasses on that are like super thick everything would just get a little bigger like and clear but that throws me off like, I try to golf with them and I I can't but I but I can see where my ball lands finally you know I don't have to have a spotter but I can can't hit the ball because my depth perception's off Interesting. Yeah, dude, it sucks. I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then I'm like, whoa, where's that ball? Like, okay, it looks like it's there, but... You literally see things differently than others. Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, when I put my glasses on, it's like, whoa, okay. Like, I can see all the details and everything literally gets bigger. Like, a lot bigger. <laughs> like, I, I, for the people that can't see, I have my hands out. Like, your head would get, like, f I don't know, maybe four inches wider. So do you, when when you're surfing, or even when you're on the bike... Is is vision a secondary sense to you? It's feel, yeah. Is feel the main sense. Yeah, probably feel feel, and then um, uh, like uh, not proprioceptive, but like my um, you know what's a spatial awareness? Yeah, but like uh, 
I see things better. Like I'm always paying attention to kind of everything, but I see things better off to the side. And you do oh, this your peripheral vision. Peripheral, yeah. So I was thinking of that word last night. I couldn't think of it. Um, yeah, peripheral vision is actually better. So when I'm looking directly at something, it's blurry, but the thing next to it's clear. So remember when I was telling you that I <laughs> that I step in dog poop all the time because I never look down, like directly. I never like I literally like Zuma. We have a we have a big bulldog and uh, man. Does he get me all the time? <laughs> We're just some big bear, and I, I stepped in dog poop up there in the snow, and I was like, fuck, every time, man. Um, but I don't look down because there's no point. So I, I kind of feel things out more. I think people walk, you know, you, when you walk around like in terrain, do you look down and like, yeah, you'd kind of notice things, and then you look down. Yeah, see, see, like I see things like 15 feet out, and then I remember what it's gonna be like when I get there, and then I'm already going another 15 feet out so i have it all kind of like memorized in my head and that's kind of how i see things but that's also how like you know how uh, shane was talking about um surfing is kind of something you do in the in the future you're doing you're you're reacting to something that's going to happen and that's how i see things so like if you're like you guys ever been to a river and your river jumping and all that stuff i'll memorize the first 15 feet and deal with that without looking at it while i'm Memorize the next 15 feet, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I noticed that. Like, And uh, uh, I don't know if other people did that or not. So, No, it's it's a common theme that I've been getting from a lot of pros is the feel of surfing. It seems to be more important or um, what's a better word? It's more like the volume's turned up on the feel of surfing rather than what it looks like. Yeah, for sure. Like you feel your way. You feel you're connected to the power source rather than looking for the power source. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, I think you, I think you hit a certain level where you don't have to, you don't have to look at that stuff. You know, like, and also, and if you did, it's all, it's all peripheral, anyways. Like, I'm not gonna directly look at it. Like, I see what's gonna happen, and then you feel, yeah, you can feel you're in the power source, and then also, like, you, you kind of see the line of it, and you know what's what's going to happen you know like you just know it like i don't know it's it's a feeling and it's also um yeah i could i think it's a lot of it's just a lot of peripheral because you're really focused on being here and then once that thing gets steep you can feel it so you're going to highline to come around or up into it or whatever so i mean i think it just kind of comes with it a lot of practice do you ever go surfing and you find yourself that you've lost touch with that feeling and things don't go right? No, like, I don't know. You see, like, I just, I haven't been surfing very much lately. You know, I, I coach so much to where it's almost like, all right, I've just been at the beach for four hours. I'm going to, um, it, look, it was good. Now it's bad, you know, so, so they kind of come first. But, um, but no, I, I, I kind of feel that, uh, I'll lose physical stuff over, over that first, you know, like, I don't, I won't lose that but I'll lose strength, you know, or something like that. But if I stay, if I train like the day before and get my nervous system fired up, I'll have that, you know, but like, so did you see that like front side air I posted the other day? It was like a, it wasn't like quite a full rotator, but it's a, it was a pretty big one. And I hadn't surfed in a month or whatever. And I had that thing and I was flipping around and my, I felt my back leg give out and core, you know, like, but I had that, like, by feeling, by pop, by timing. That was all on physicals, wasn't it? Yeah, you can watch it. I'm like right there. I spin it around, and I'm like, uh, and in the water, I was like, oh, dude. Yeah, so. When did you start coaching? Man, um, if you look back, uh, the, we went to um, El Salvador, and there was this guy, this guy Hunter, who, who surfs good, this kid Hunter. And I was kind of like the only real pro on that that trip. We had, like, some friends and all that stuff, and there was a young kid. But he kept doing um, – on your back end, it's hard to – it was a photo trip, you know. On your back end, it's hard to get um, different shots because you kind of do the same turns, right points, and you kind of do the same turns over and over again. Uh, I just coached him a little bit on how to mix it up. I'm like, dude, you got 500 of those shots. I'm like, all right, so what are you going to do? Let's mix it up. Okay, we're going to have to blow that tail, so you're going to start that transition – are you going to come up steeper 
and you're going to transition into the lip and get that tail out and down the down the line, you know, mix it up. There's different stuff. Okay, now back to there. So I started, if you read the article, it goes, it starts saying, <laughs> I think there's a part that says, Coach Adam Knox, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, like, professionally, I started working with Aton Osborne, who's number one in the QS right now, and he just made his heat yesterday in pipe. Um, started working with him, and then um, I went to the Czech Institute, for corrective holistic exercise kinesiology. And then, uh, yeah, and I was just approached by a few people and, um, I was building airplanes at the time. So it was like right after that, after, after your contracts go away, it's a real, real hard place to get out of. Cause you know, a lot of us surfers are, you know, fairly prideful and stuff. You can't just go work, you know, you can't just go work at a restaurant you know it like hurts it hurts your pride too much and then once people see that they're like oh he's done for good and it, and people want to see you fail too you know so you got to like hide and work at the same time so there's a lot of my friends right now that are judging because they're heading behind the scaffolding you know like but they still surf on a professional level you know um but yeah i know i was i was approached just by a few people and then i just kind of, you know, with the Czech background and knowing how the body works and all that stuff and then knowing the surfing, I kind of feel like you need all that stuff. Um, and then I was just getting results dude, and people people wanted it and you could, you know, it's a pretty fun life. You, you know, kind of get paid to surf still. So it's probably like, to answer your question, it's probably like uh, eight years ago. Yeah. Well, why did you start, what inspired you to start coaching? Um. I, again, it, I, nothing really inspired me to do it. It just, it was kind of a high demand. And uh, my friend Jeff Belzer, he kind of like, he owns uh, Ventura Makos. I know you're from Malibu, so you know Malibu Makos. He's a, he owns a Ventura part of that. And uh, he, he just was like, kind of like testing me out. Like, oh, can I use this guy for something, you know? And then I coached, head coach for Ventura High surf team, coach for Ventura Junior High surf team, coached all the other top guys, did all this stuff, and it just kind of snowballed effect. And, and I had fun doing it, you know? It's um it's hard with the with the younger guys, you know, because they're not quite there yet, you know. Like I almost need someone to bring them up, but I have some guys, you know, like say, I, you know, I had I worked with Cole McCaffrey, um, and Richard Billabong at Oakley and all that stuff since he was ten, and he wasn't quite there then. But he's once we got him to a certain point, it's on because now I just adjust, you know, adjust their turns and and give them, you know different combinations and that kind of stuff where it gets really fun. You know, you can kind of surf through them almost, but there's like, there's that gray area with the little guys who are like, man, like, all right, yeah, you got to get up, you got to work on your pop-ups, you got to do that stuff. So with my, you know, neutrality, you know, the elite surf camps that I do in the summer where we're, we're coaching, we're running mock heats, we're doing mini contests, um, we're doing the carving technique stuff and we're doing all the video review and we do that all week long with the training that's fun. It's fun to see them go through all that stuff. But um, I kind of opened the floodgates for the Groms right now. So, did you coach yourself? When Dude, you were, back when you were that's 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 uh that's a that's a really good question. I actually coach myself now. It's 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 super weird. Um, I'm getting better, like better now than I ever have been, and I rarely surf. <laughs> like I should surf more, and I need to, and I'm going to. Um, but um. I serve better now than than ever. I just understand it more. It's I just I became a stu- student of it, you know. Yeah. And I think that's I mean that's probably the best advice to anybody out there is like, dude, look at the small stuff. Watch Mick. Look, you don't look at his turn. Look at where he's looking as he enters his turn. Look where his chest is facing as he finishes his turn. Look how he transitions out of that turn. It's all these little intricate details, hand placement breathing everything like look at the little stuff guys where did you learn that i just taught myself that i mean you just it's one of those things i mean you just but why i don't know i don't know man i've always been like that just kind of so back when you started being on a salary for surfing would you go back and look at photos and go that's sick but what is my wrist my wrist's weird next time i'm gonna make sure my hand's in a aesthetic position were you that yeah kind of like so would you say hands my hands are actually always i thought were good my hands are always like this they're always leading to where i was going um but i wasn't flexible so i was missing grabs all the time right so i'm like i would touch my rail but i wouldn't quite grab it but no not as much you know if they were happy then i was happy that was that was the kind of thing i i wish i was like that but i wasn't 
So when did it start? When did you start looking at the the finer details of technique? Was that when you became a coach? Yeah, when I became a coach, it was you know when it's your job. I mean, I guess it was my job then, you know. So it just depends on what your mind state is, dude. It's all it's all to me in life. It's all state of mind. You know, you could be a millionaire, like Taylor says. You know, Taylor said in you know momentum generation. It's like all right, a guy could be, you know bummed for winning a contest the guy that got third was ecstatic you know who really won you know so um yeah for me it's all state of mind and you know back then my my state of mind was like f it dude like i i was trying to prove a point like all right you know because you grow up as as someone's your brother's already famous and all that stuff so you're getting chastised and and ridiculed and the sponsors you have you only got for him and all that you know from him and all that stuff and um that that wasn't the case and and there were some some people I approached for sure like audio and you know there was a shoe company back then that that he was on that probably shooed me in for that but um it really made it made it a lot harder for for everything else so at that point I was just like dude you know what I made it they can't take away my contest results they can't take away my mag time and now you know all those people that just hated like for no reason really you know, because I was really adversarial too, because I had so much coming at me all the time that everyone, you know, I was a hammer and everyone was a nail, you know, and or to them, I was the nail and they were the hammer. So, so I just kind of had this bad boy thing all the time. I started riding for no fear. Did you that, know? Does that part of what drove you, do you think? Yeah, that drove me, which is the complete wrong thing to drive someone, you know, that's the only reason why I went, it didn't go as far as I should have, you know. So when you take on a new athlete, what's, and you're looking for what drives them or what well, are you looking for what drives them? Or yeah, I, I I definitely do. I mean, I look at all that stuff. I mean, coaching is mostly psychology, you know, and I got a lot of like, you know, business people and stuff. They're like, Adam, you're too close to these guys or, you know, blah, blah, blah. You have to be. So it'd be better to have four clients or five clients that you, you know, that could afford to pay you almost full time. And you could be with them all the time, you know, like that, that would get the best bang for your buck. But really, I mean, most, most of these kids are being driven by their parents. So I do look for in them a self drive for sure, you know, and that's going to be that. And, and the thing is, I'm also looking t- to see that drive kick in as well. Because right now a lot of them are remote control surfers. What do you mean by that? Like, they're just, you know, well, the, the people can have their dads on the beach and kind of, like, directing them on which wave to go and all that stuff where they should have the intuition and heat IQ to go out there and surf their own heat. Yeah. You know, like, okay, there's a game plan on the beach. You know, I'm, some people don't like this about me because I'm not going to be jumping around and acting like a crazy person on the beach. But the game plan's set. This is what's happening. It's changed. Okay, we watched the last heat. We saw who won. We We identified why. Okay, this is your game plan. But the thing is, it's you know, it's hard to keep a solid game plan out there because it's going to change. So they have to have intuition and be able to change with the ocean. Another reason why surfing is a hard sport. Yeah, intuition. So you want, you're, you're teaching your athletes to be self-sufficient, self-reliant. I, I do, and, you know, some people, I mean, I try to, and some parents don't like that. They want a full-on thing, or some athletes. You know, I, I, I keep saying parents because I'm working with a lot of young guys right now. But, um, you know, a lot of these young guys, they're going to be, you know, 15, you know, in a year, you know, and, you know, then it's it's different. And they, everyone starts backing off and, and they, they just need to rise up, you know, with me. And, you know, and if I'm not, and if they're not just progressing and clicking all the time, like I was saying, then I'm not doing my job or, and or they're not putting everything into it. Then we got to figure out where to go from there, you know. Do you talk about um, flow states and being in the zone with um, your clients? No, I mean, that flow state is something that you've talked about a couple of times, and maybe you can enlighten me on. on well, that. it sounds like it's. It sounds like for you, it's something that naturally happens. Yeah, that's it. And probably if you're if you're coaching naturally gifted athletes, they're probably naturally falling into the zone or whatever. But when you're in the zone, time slows down. Like you might, you, like for example, you might see. Wow, I just got a ten second barrel and then you look at the footage and it was you were in there for one second. Yeah, kinda. Like for me, if I get scared or something like that, I actually I'm able to go flat. Like What do you mean? Like uh 
say like say like in a fight or something like that like no emotion go time go flat like not not flat to where no energy but just nothing neutral neutral just aware of what's going on yeah just like all right you know it's just, this is a very pivotal moment it could go really bad or really good you know and i think that you know i'm just using uh you know you know martial arts or whatever for for that reason but yeah it's like to to be able to like just go, yeah i guess that would be a flow state it's like it's like a state of nothingness almost yeah, yeah this yeah when you're just aware of what's going on now you're not yeah thinking there's about one there's only one thing you gotta do so um but i've also been in that there's dude uh, so like when i was you know doing well in the contest they told me not to do contests you know okay go be a photo guy and then when the contest got popular again we had to go back to it and i had to relearn it all those butterflies and all that stuff they all came back you know you almost have to establish you know i almost say like control the fear because the fear of others you don't need to be that confident you know it's like th- their confidence drops so you can just be you almost if that makes any sense right because if not you're that freaked out dude and these guys know that they can beat you but if you beat them a bunch then you control the fear you know they're like, oh man, like any heat draw, okay, and you know that, and you have that over them, and then you can go out there and just surf. Whenever you're just surfing, you're surfing your best. If you're going out there going, oh man, and you're over pumped and all that stuff, which I've you know did forever, it took me a long time. I had to beat these guys slowly to feel confident and know that they feared me in their heat, you know. Interesting, but that's just me, you know, like it's a mentality thing, you know, but. It's all the same thing. You could you could you could word that a different way without that, you know, and it wouldn't sound as crazy and aggressive, but that's all kind of what it is, you know. Yeah. So you you're naturally getting into that flow state. So you're kind of uh lucky in a way. Because a lot of people have to really work for that. Like Yeah, you know, maybe I grew up you know, I we you know, just like Taylor said, you saw my dad on that on that momentum generations with the big old did you did you end up seeing that? I haven't seen it yet. Oh dude best thing ever like best documentary ever in surfing for sure but he talks about like um you know shows a picture of my dad he had like big old fu manchu and he was a he was a musician that was like on the rise and he was a big fish in a small pond so he was like kind of famous in ojai and ventura and all that kind of stuff and then drugs and all that stuff messed it all up and uh he talked about the fights between our dad and my mom, so we have the same dads and different moms, yeah. And how they just wake up with black eyes and all that crazy stuff. And um, and uh, anyways, we grew up grew up pretty hard. So I think you have to. It's a fight or flight thing, you know. That's why I use the you know that uh, analogy with fighting. Um, that's the way we grew up. So you wanted to escape home life a lot of the time. Well escape home life but also i wanted to protect like i have a huge um like a uh, savior complex so <laughs> you know so to be able to protect but just just seeing all that crazy stuff kind of makes you numb to it as well so so maybe that's where that flow state comes in it's you know you have to survive so i'm flowing now because i know what i have to do to get out of here <laughs> or do what i have to do to get my brother out of there or whatever so and that's probably that's probably where it comes from and like you, you said, you know, back in the motocross days, you used to watch videos, and then go out and try. Yeah, no, for sure. You gotta watch watch those guys, and I, I do it now to this day. And I didn't race a bunch, you know. I only done a, a couple races, but um, but uh, but with motocrosses, I'm I'm gonna guess that those videos were very detail orientated, because you're hitting the same jump. Okay, if you hit this at 50 miles per hour, it's not gonna happen. If you hit it at 53, it's on the money. Yeah, well, it's physics. You know. physics right and it comes into play a lot because you're dealing with hard ground and oh, yeah. and crazy powerful machines in surfing a little bit casual because it's water and it's like eh but it sounds like what you've done is you've taken that um, that detailed coaching element from motocross and brought it to surfing yeah well now for sure I mean because you know back then when I was a kid didn't have that stuff you know I'd have a couple guys like okay you didn't have some you know weight on your inside peg or sorry your outside peg when you're you know doing a you know a left turn and all this stuff which I'm like oh it doesn't really make sense then you think about it it actually does it loads up and it grips that way um, but yeah you can go on YouTube and just learn pretty much anything where I want to post some more videos on YouTube there's some there's some guys out there and I mean those guys are getting 100,000 hits for stuff that's really simple 
Um, I don't know if I could do it because I might overload people, but no, maybe. I think I don't know. You, you've you've coached with me. I mean, what exactly. Do you, what do you think? So my personal experience would be that. I mean, this is for me personally. It was like you're the most detail oriented coach I've ever worked with, which I really appreciate because it's. I guess in some ways I'm the opposite of you. It's sort of I, I don't naturally fall into the flow state unless shit's on the line. Like if, I, if I'm surfing a slab, and if I don't make the drop, I'm going to get pushed into the reef. Then I'll click into the zone. But if I'm surfing my three foot beach break, it's it's so hard for me not to get lost in the future or the past. What brought me back was what brings me back, and what I learned from you is thinking about the details. So instead of thinking in seconds, I'm thinking of milliseconds. Yeah. So it's like you're like, okay, what are you gonna do now? And then what's next? It's like you broke the. And most coaches will break the bottom turn into one or two. Okay, do this and this, and that's your bottom turn. But you're like, now you've got this before the bottom turn, this during the bottom turn, this on the exit of the bottom turn. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. I know it's that's good. A, I know it's a pain. Such a pain. It's good because that's what brings you back. You, there's no way you can change. So let's say a bottom turn lasts half a second on a on a medium small well, wave. Unless, so, unless you're like Tom Kern, where it lasts like. 40 feet. <laughs> let's, say it lasts right, one, right. let's say it lasts one second. Yeah. Right? M most people won't have, or most coaches won't coach anything more than one or two things in that one second. But you're like, no, 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 no. Come on, we're going to do this, this, and this during that one second. And if you, gotta, if you really want to get better at surfing and you really want to get better, at, you, ha you have to get better at a bottom turn, right? Yeah. It sets up everything. And if your bottom turn's really bad, then you've got to get detailed and you've got to change it, not just slightly, you've got to change it like a lot. Yeah. You do this, this, and this. Well, well especially if you're doing this, this, and this wrong, you know, that's exactly. the thing. So exactly. You could break down every single thing so much. It's crazy. But it's good. And I think that's yeah. what people need. Yeah. Because it happens a lot in others. So you look at, look at golf. Like people are slow motion footage of their swing. Over and over again. Over and over, it's and it's the same. Dude, golf and surfing, man, two hardest things. Yeah. Your body can break down in just every little way, you know. I love golf because it's so hard. I love surfing because it's so hard. Those are, those are the reasons I'm attracted to those two things. Like, you, you play golf for that, you know, those few good shots, you know. And uh, surfing, you, I mean, at this point now, it's like, okay, but... But I mean, I'm sure, like, so you know, at your level, you're probably doing it for that one, one or two good turns that day. You know, something may, maybe you blew the fins out and and it caught just right, and and you you know got some tail release and back, and that probably felt just amazing. You know, probably going for that kind of stuff. Where, yeah, I don't know. For me, when I surf, it's almost like all right, you know, it's kind of almost almost the same stuff. You know, and then. Yeah, if I push myself or whatever, then it's a little bit better. But then, if no one caught it on tape, then <laughs> it's like it never happened. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm definitely not that soul surfer. But um, but yeah, no, it's uh, there's so much stuff to break down. Um, yeah, well, I think focusing on the details for me brings me into the moment more. Yeah, that's 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 rad though. And and, and to be self aware, like for you to even realize that is huge. That makes you super coachable. Like, as I as I was coaching you. I saw I saw you trying it, which was rad, but it made your surfing so much worse because you were trying to figure it out. And then that getting that text or that call three days later going, dude, I'm surfing better now than ever, that was huge. I was like, heck yeah, like that, that was epic. Um, that's what I want. And sometimes you have to detrain somebody before you can move forward, you know? Like you were trying, you were trying to run before you could walk, you know? And, uh, and then, you know, there's all these like, you know, energy leaks and body leaks and all that stuff. And if you can get it right and you can feel it, once you feel that, like that acceleration and your board push back into you and, and you push through the turn, that's on. But it takes so many things, you know, like eyes first, then you turn your head then you turn your head, then you turn your chest. After you turn your chest, then the arm comes through, after the arm comes through the hip and the end of the whip is the, the crack of the whip is that board, yeah. you know. So everything has to go down pretty much, but it comes up first because it comes off the bottom. But but it's it's hard, you know. It goes. Whoo. But you like um, you have the 
the confidence to to be blunt. Firstly, a lot of coaches like to um, be politicians in some way, like be nice and and I think as surfers, if if there's something you you're doing wrong and a coach sees it, I mean, it's their, it's their duty to tell you exactly. I, I that's agree. what you're paying them for. Yeah, yeah, and you might lose some clients because of that, but I think the ones that appreciate and get gains from that are going to be the, the ones that are serious about it because the, the bluntness and the attention to detail is uh, you I mean I've only coached with you once but I would say that's your strength yeah yeah well thank you I appreciate that and um yeah and that kind of came kind of came naturally it's like you know like like you were saying you might lose some clients and and all that stuff and that's that's the thing about me is like I try not to have too much you know kind of you know, BS or whatever. Like I want to be the straight shooter and, uh, and I'm not afraid to tell anybody what's up, you know, from what I think, you know, um, and coaching and life, any of that stuff, you know, and, uh, this, I think the coaches that are out there that are, are, are doing that are, are just trying to make their clients, um, happy and keep them, keep that money coming a lot of times, you know, and that's not everybody, but you know, maybe some guys are just nice and, or they don't see it. You know, and I'm not anyone to be able to tell them, you know, like, I can't tell you that they can't see it, you know, and maybe, they, or, you know, or what, you know, whatever the reason is, but, I mean, you got to be pretty technical, and, and like, I, I've been surfing for, what, 20 years now, and 11 years a pro, and then I, I just signed that, that contract with Seaway, that Brazilian company, for two and a half years for, you know, pro contract, you know, you got, I think you got to kind of have it all, and or study your butt off. Like if you if you don't have that like kind of pro in that that level, I think you have to be a crazy student, or else it's kind of just theory, you know. Like I've proven it, I can go do it, you know, a full row. I can do you know the alley oops and the turns and the cutbacks, and I know my weaknesses and I'm not the best at anything, and I have a bunch of holes in my game, but I've, I've done it, you know. So when I when I talk about it, it's not just it's not just because I heard it on a podcast or something like that. It's because I've, I've done it. I've, I've proved it. And, uh, and, and it's, it's not theory anymore. You know, I think it starts out that way and then you, you figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Surfing is hard. <laughs> it's hard, dude. <laughs> it's so hard. I mean, like, I mean, you know, not to keep quoting everybody, but like Kelly said, I think on that thing as well, he's like, he's like, oh, shit, I don't think it was on that. It was, it was, it was on Joe Rogan. He was like, He's like, dude, I know guys that have been here for 50 years that suck. And it's because no one ever told them they sucked. You know? And you can tell them in a nice way. Or you can just be like, hey, dude. Uh, dude, it's crazy because I coach so much now that I want to let people know. And people might take that offensively, you know, which sucks because that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help them out. I'm like, here, my bro, here, try this. Oh, yeah, okay. Like, you know, bro. I'm like, well, you just try it. <laughs> just try it. Well, on that note, what's. Um, in the average everyday surfer you see down at the beach, what's the most common problem you see? Oh man, um, there's a lot, man. There's a lot. You know, with the with with the youth, I would say what I'm working with now with a lot, you know, with the younger guys is um, they don't highline, dude. Okay, if you're up, if you're high on the wave. It's like drop. Okay, if you're high, it's like you know everyone's dropped into like a, a half pipe or a quarter pipe if they skate, right? You accelerate, right? So think of a wave as a as a as like a quarter pipe or a half pipe or whatever. And if you're high, like Felipe Toledo stays high, you can. If you're high, you can. You have speed on tap, right? Potential energy, right? It's sitting there, and you can drop down. It's like a boulder rolling down. You know, boulder is stuck, and then it gets loose and it's rolling down. And when as you're, if you stay high, and or utilize floaters. Right, like lip line floaters, not ones you know the ones that you go on the on the roof, they reach like a terminal velocity where they start to slow down too. You know, you have a certain point where you need to exit, and it's kind of like a more of an ending maneuver. But that speed float where you just get up and you're off centered and you're loaded up and you're gonna come up around, and as you push down over your board as you as you drop down, that's the highest line you can get. Can't go any higher than that unless you're going to air and like land on the transition perfectly, which we don't really do. Um, but to high line and do floaters, I think is the people that aren't using them because they're functional, they're conjunctional, 
right? They link you up into the next turn. They slingshot you. So after a floater, you'd usually go about 10 feet over a section or, or longer or whatever it is. And then you, you drop down and you're going to go straight off the bottom. You're going to load up off the bottom, come straight back over vert into the lip. Hey, so that's two for one right there. Not only is it functional, it's it's points. So that's one thing. And another thing too is like a lot of people, they don't like to be in that low position. Um, I remember when I was when I was a kid, Taylor's like, dude, I'm going to get a freaking, I'm going to get a rope and tie it to your hips and tie it to your board so you stay down. But the thing is, what he should have said is, hey, dude, go do wall sits. Go do squats. Go get down in that low position to where you freaking like it. And you can stay down there. Because I didn't have the physical strength to do that. And these kids don't either. So that's where right now I'm like, all right, you guys need to build up here. Jim, 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 Jim. Carver. Okay, now let me see what you're looking like in the okay, in the water. All right, okay, you can't be back in the water for a while. Like surf, surf, you know, go practice. But I need to see that physical ability because I can, I can coach you to death. But if you physically can't do it, there's no point. I'm wasting everyone's time and money. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That. Oh, yeah. It's a. It's a big. It's two. Two big ones. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Highline. Like. You mentioned to that me last time. And Dude, look. Watch. Watch like momentum. Like. Like. Watch all the old videos. All I do is floaters, but it make. It makes sense. Um. Yeah. And then uh, let me see. The third one would probably be. We'll get it. Well, the second one, getting low. Oh yeah. That's just mm-hmm. like. It comes back to basic physics as well. If you stand up straight with your knees locked and your hips locked and someone pushes you, you're going to fall over. But if you're down in a fighting stance or a, a good low surfing stance, no one can push you over. Yeah, that neutrality stance that we do, that, you know, with the hinge back, all your muscles are loaded up. And you can you can always go up and down when you're low. When you're up, you can only go down. Exactly. But when you're up, your hips want to come forward with most people, Right. A deviation of the hips, all that stuff. So to keep that butt back and be back in that, that position, I mean, you guys can try it at home. Stand straight up and have someone push you. Okay, now now take a big breath. Blow your core out 360 degrees, so big fat core. And then bend your knees and keep your back flat as you hinge. And then now have someone push you. You're not going anywhere. You know, that's what I, we, we we put into all our training, you know. We so we call it, you know, neutrality. I know it's here in Carlsbad, and um, I guess I'll, I'll plug that a little bit. Um, it's it's a place that I thought of, you know, I just thought it was, you know, exactly what I needed. You know, it's like you're asking if I had coaching and stuff. I didn't. I needed a place like this. You know, I needed, like, a place where I could walk in. Everybody wanted to, you know, I was everyone's case study, you know, because everyone brought something else to the table. One-stop shop for me to reach my ceiling. You may not be the next Kelly Slater. You may not be making the tour. But if you want to go do the QS and all that stuff, you need work. You know, we all do. Um, or well, even if surfing's your chosen craft and you just want to get better. Dude, 100%, 100%. I mean, I wish I had, I actually wish I had more clients, like say like you, or <laughs> that just wanted to get better and that were stoked on getting coached, you know. But I think I, I think ego gets in the way of a lot of people, you know. But it's part of the culture as well, like, I mean, you look at golf, everyone's getting lessons. Tennis, everyone's getting lessons because it's part of the culture. Right. Surfing, there's, at the moment... It's a cliche. It's like, changing, but it's yeah. still that... Oh, but know. when they grew up, it was cliche. Like, the guys our age, you know, it was cliche to do that stuff. So, like, it wasn't cool, you know. So, uh, it's understandable. But, I mean, I get so many things on, on Instagram. Like, hey, when are you going to do an adult surf class? I'm like, I'll do it whenever you guys want. And then I never hear from them again, <laughs> you know. So... But yeah, I mean, everyone thinks that I'm just like straight up kids and, you know, juniors and all that stuff. And yeah, it's good to get them young and and coach them up so they're good enough to work with them when they're older. But I would love to work with a group, you know, let's say like, you know, four dudes wanted to go out and get coached and trained and videoed and video analysis. You're going to get better, man. All these people, most of of these guys, they're in a prison, man. They're they're, uh, they're not going to figure it out. It's going to be hard. I mean, it depends, but dude, what I think I give is freedom, you know, like I'm at a point on my surfboard, right? I have freedom, you know, I can do what I want. If I want to go float something and do a 360 out and an air reverse and all that stuff or a cutback or whatever, maybe I can do. I'm pretty free in that sense. I mean, I'll be able to paddle into Chopu or anything like that <laughs> without, without hitting the ground and dying, you know, but when it comes to like just just surfing man i i have freedom and and it's so much better i mean i mean matt like 
I remember being a kid, and that's another thing. It's like I'm able to go back to where these guys were in my head and go, all right, yeah, do I remember exactly what that was like? So this is what would help that, you know. But they're they're locked up, and they're not going to get unlocked until they figure it out, you know. So the the whole thing, you know, is to go from from A to B, right? The quickest way, because if not, you got you're going to have that that guy that's in his van thinking he's shredding, but really he's just, you know. I think he's just living the dream and, and, and it's all a dream. <laughs> yeah, which is all fine until you take that attitude um, on a surf trip and you hit the reef and realize, oh, I'm not that good. Or you realize, I can't even keep up with that wave. Yeah, right. And and the, and those are two easy things right there. So you said hit the reef. So obviously, he doesn't know that he needs to take or she take three or four more paddles before they stand up. You got to get under that thing, right? That's one. That's, that's how you crack that. Um, maybe, maybe board up, and then also if if he can't make the wave, he's obviously not staying in the in the energy of the wave because you're using the speed of the wave when you're on it, plus the speed that you that you generate yourself, right? With your muscles and and in your lines, so you add those two together and you're going 30 miles an hour. But now if you're sitting at the bottom of the wave and just doing little, uh, 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 the wave is like almost like it's catching up to you and it's barely moving you, right? You're not using the wall and everything else. So, I mean, really there's no energy there. So I would tell that person, okay, use the whole wave, go to the top, bend your knees and push on the way down and then reload. It's all about that pushing and reloading. Like, you know, muscles are like rubber bands. You stretch them and then unstretch them, but you don't go all the way. You got to keep some tension there, right? There has to be some tension. If you go all the way into that, like, that like kind of dark spot like if you like say if you do a squat and you go too deep then you got to come out of that but if you squat just the right amount where your your hamstrings and everything else they stretch out and they want to go back the other way right so you got to keep it there you don't want to go and that's just some another thing we work on is just that stopping power surfing is all about that stopping power it's all flowy and then as you come down like look at dane reynolds he just goes boom he stops and just explodes out of it right kind of like jumping and landing yeah but jumping and landing soft yeah Right, like you don't cat. want to, you don't want to just go. Ugh. You want to go. Whoosh. You, you know, like you want to like absorb the ground. Yeah, and then you want to be able to jump out of that again, like load up and unload up. Yeah, load up and unload. Yeah. So, but yeah. Is is there a surfer you you look to to learn from? Like, who has the best technique? <sighs> Ooh. Well, yeah. There's three. Um, three when I was growing up, for sure. My brother always like you got to. You know, the show, good times, all that stuff. I mean, really nobody's got a better style, right? Mick Fanning, like Fanning the Fire, his, like, first movie. It's one of my favorites. And I just was watching Momentum Under the Influence when he was, like, 21 or, or 20 or something like that. He was, all like, wiry and a little more fast, like, wiry, you know, whatever, like, really whippy back then before he put on the, the meat and the muscle and all that stuff. He still is, but not as much. He was kind of wiry and whoosh. Um, and Taj. Yeah, Taj. I liked, I, a lot of people like would say, oh, either surf a Taj or Mick or whatever. And then um, and then I got, uh, who was the guy that surfed like ta- or like Mick, but like fell short. He rode for Oakley. He was a blonde guy. He looked like Mick too. He was on tour for a long time. People would start saying that, so I kind of fell. He he fell short of Mick. You could tell he like tried to mimic Mick, and made the tour and all that stuff, and then kind of didn't quite get there. Mick mastered what he did, and then I fell fell short of that stuff. But yeah, it was like a mix of those guys. Sometimes I, you know, guys would paddle up like, "Hey, I think it's because I look like Taylor." Be like, "Oh, you know, you surf a lot like Taylor." And I'd be like at, you know, at Rincon or something like that, and then I've, you know, different times like, "Oh, you surf like Taj." It just depends. Like, but the thing is, I think with athletes, you should be able to mimic. I think the best athletes are able to just go, okay, and copy somebody real quick. Mm. But in terms of like halfway through the re-entry, where's your, where are your eyes looking? Um, where do you get those details well, from? Well, that, that depends. So if you were going to copy Taj, Taj usually would come through that turn and throw the tail and probably look just down and over where Mick would come through a turn and do a hook and he'd be looking behind him, you know? They're they're looking to where their board is their their feet and their toe side rail is gonna end up if they're on their front side. And if you watch Taj, he does a lot of like does like that out the back almost where he's kinda looking this way. It depends. Unless he's gonna do like a, a full row or something like that, or like a tail throw, then he'll look over, but he does a lot of the 
kind of ch- like almost like a check turned, but he has so much snap and stuff and he's up in the lip and then he airdrops from that. So it just depends on that. But I think the best surfer all around who I can't really figure out, which I, you know, I, I kind of had a good idea the other day on what's going on there, but Dane Reynolds, dude, best surfer in the world still right now. We were just at a wedding with him and Courtney was like, that guy's a surfer. I'm like, dude, he's the best surfer. And she's like, he doesn't look like a surfer. I'm like, dude, trust me. <laughs> just trust me. I'm like, I don't, you know, he doesn't, I don't know how much he surfs now or whatever, but I mean, we just saw him on that, uh, whatever that, that, uh, board testing. Thing. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. What was it called? Electric. Electric. Es- electric acid. acid test or something? Yeah. Like, yeah. It was on stab. It was an electric yeah. acid surfboard. But that's a good testament to, you know what? Your board choice is pretty important but your technique is always going to override because he's surfing some pretty strange boards with good technique and ripping yeah no he he is um but i mean i like how honest he is though too like you know he's like dude i don't ride this stuff i ride my short board and that's it and that's how i am too um but but yeah it's a testament to i mean once you're that good i don't really think it matters but on the boards that you could tell that worked well Dude, it's so crazy. When he comes in that top turn, his, dude, his back leg is just a hammer. But the, what trips me out the most, after he goes, whoa, and he comes through that front side turn, and he does like, you know, he's three quarters of the way through, and he drops the hammer and turns his hips, like, and his board just blows up and turns 180. His his eccentric load up, or unload right there into concentric load is so smooth. It's cr- He gets so much speed out of that. When he just did a stop turn, he should have stopped. You see Kelly do those? He stops. You see Dane do those? He comes out with speed. And then next thing you know, his knees are up by his freaking head, and he's loading up again. It's just the craziest thing. I remember when first chapter came out, his first video, and I was like, this is even a fun video to watch because it's really unrealistic. Unre- like, I can't do any of this. Like, he just did a grab rail turn, went underwater, and came out backwards like – like what happened under there <laughs> that would be actually a good thing for stab to do is like film him underwater and show us what the hell is happening because <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he like lets go and gets on his belly and then like he stands up you know no, i know that's not what's going on but i'd like to hope so so i don't feel so dumb and you know what's funny too is like oh i'll have like a cool little edit on my instagram and then um i'll watch him afterwards don't do that everybody don't it makes you feel so <laughs> stupid literally like like and like an average day out in the water or whatever, you know, I could be one of the better guys out there, but <laughs> don't, don't watch your edit and then go watch Dane or vice versa. Cause it's, it makes you feel like a child. It really does. It's super gnarly. You, you mentioned that, um, you kind of alluded or hinted at that. The fact that maybe is, do you think Taylor got as good as he is through hard work? Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I don't think, um, I don't think he's the most, you know, I don't think, and a lot of people have said this, you know, I don't think he's the most talented surfer out there, you know. There's a lot of guys that get away with murder, you know. Um, you know, whatever, partying, doing whatever, and uh, he, you know, Taylor's had his fun, and he's done all that stuff, but, man, he loves to surf. All he does is surf. You're not going to see him on a downhill mountain bike. You're not going to see him on a dirt bike. You're not really going to see him do anything but surfing. And that's what he loves, you know. And I love that about him. Like, that's great. But I just feel like there's a lot of other things out there that I love, you know, and there always has been. So, but, yeah, I think that discipline, I mean, no one's more driven and more disciplined in that sense. But it wouldn't be hard if you loved it that much. Yeah. Does he get very detailed orientated? We, You know, he's come up He's come up in the – he sat next to, like, a me and a kid, you know, at Neutrality, and – uh sat down and we were saying the same things he was just saying them differently and then i would say and he'd be like no Um, but he didn't realize we're saying the same things and then also like if you're working with the kid for a long time he understands your terminology and not so but also yeah he wasn't it wasn't as more detailed it's like no he's like you want to do this and like we don't through and he probably is depending and then once he just doesn't he hasn't done it that that much he talks more about the feeling rather than yeah i bet i mean i'm sure it's way different because he's just doing it for for him right now you know but once you have to break it down and you realize there's so many walls to break down with people then you got to get detailed you know 
it would be great if I could just be like, yeah, dude, you want to come up and you want to feel the wind in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I don't know. I don't know enough about that. And I wish, I wish, I mean, I'll show up my stuff. And I mean, actually we, I just did a contest, the warm water classic in Carlsbad. And he said, I'm like, Oh my God, you got any you know pointers? I, you know, I think I made that heat or whatever. And I was kind of going on the medium waves because, again, like I hadn't been surfing very much and I was pumping. And like there was like some tens out there, barrels and all that stuff. But I'd go on like the wider ones and, and go to go to surfing because I can manufacture scores. But I like I have a lot of like torque and, and, and hip throw and like kind of throw my tail and stuff like that. And he's like, dude, you're a strong surfer. He's just like your technique isn't that spot on. He's like, you should probably come into that turn softer and – loaded up properly instead of just dropping the hammer but in my head I was going dude I was behind the eight ball I needed to I needed to throw as much flare at the judges as possible so I'm going to use my weapon which is my hip rotation and my back leg you know and when I came in a lot of the guys you know that aren't as knowledgeable were like dude that was the sickest turn in the contest you know yeah you know there wasn't there were some better turns for sure and it was pretty early in the contest um, my buddy Ulysses was like, dude, that was sick. Or Taylor was like, yeah, that wasn't that sick. <laughs> so, but you know, he's right. I mean, it's, it's actually something that I started implementing to my guys. I'm like, Hey, I'm like, dude, let's go slow through that thing almost. And let's get it down before you start applying more pressure. That's pretty much the, essentially what Taylor was saying to me. So thanks for the tip there, brother. Yeah. Well, th- no, you had, you said a similar, similar thing to me and cause I think I had a, v- uh, um, probably still do have a habit of being very like snappy and because I, I, vis- I envisioned surfing as bottom turn up to the lip bang throw spray and fall back down yep but then you made me realize is no 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 you got to hold that position through the turn to maintain your speed stay on rail and then another change of direction back to the opposite rail and yeah. for me, what it it, it made surfing, because I think that bottom turn up to the top, pa, that sort of thought process, is like is how we sometimes see things when we're watching surfing videos. We see the highlights, right? Or more specifically, it's like when we look in the magazines. That's the photo, pa, right? But that pa is only a moment of actually a pa, right? All the way around, like yep. that that snapshot is just happens to be when the rooster spray was going up. We actually want the rooster spray to go all around. With around, you. yeah. You know, it, it depends. It depends. I mean, if you're going to go into that kind of, ho- I call them hooks. People call them cars. You know, Mick kind of does like that hook. It's like a three in one. It comes off the bottom, kind of goes into that rail turn, but clip, clips the lip. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's kind of a roundhouse, but there's a snap and then there's a, you know, a tail release hip throw at the end. Right. So it's like a three in one. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of what you were doing, I'm, I'm watching it in my head right now, is you were coming, come off the bottom, and you were real quick to, like, unload off the bottom, which made you extend, to hit the lip, and do, like, a bash, and there's there's places for bashes, like, maybe on end sections, or, say, you drop in, and the wave is, like, a TP, you know, it had a big A-frame, so you want to come back at it, and the only thing you could do is go, like, oververt, and bash it there and then come up and wait for it to go to rail and then do another turn, right? But you were kind of just like unloading and loading too much. And then also you were you were letting your, your body raise up as you went through the turn. So when, you're, when your chest flares, your chest comes up, then your hips are going to come forward and that's where a lot of things were falling apart for you. But you, you I mean, you have, you, have, you surf good, man. You have that stuff, but but you, you have that and it feels good to you. You know, you're probably like, oh man, I just crushed that thing. And you did, but it's real choppy. You know, exactly. technically un- unsound. The reason I bring it up is, is because it's it's something very common that I see in a lot of average everyday surfers. Yeah. And it, it's that stop, start, go up to the lip, smash it, pa, lose all your speed, fall back down and do it again. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Right. It's, it's fun to hit stuff. But when you start learning, actually, if you have, if you keep your speed consistent and you're on rail through the whole turn rather than just bash, fall, bash, fall, surfing is more fun and you have more options. Yeah, I mean, I, I talk about it as like, come off the bottom and as you're coming up into the lip, come, like, if you look at Dane, he comes off the bottom really hard and by the time he's like a foot or two feet up the wave, he's already over vert and he, he creates like an S. So he goes top or bottom turn and he comes up 
and he's already on his other rail before he hits the lip, which gives him that crazy whip and explosion down. You'll see, okay, another thing that I see that's bad in a lot of the kids is they start their transition into their turn way too late because they think it's going to send them out the back and do a blow tail. But really, if they started the transition earlier, lower on the wave, when they when they get to the lip on rail, that's when that, that that's when that it legitimately would happen. These guys are going straight up, and as you climb this hill for so long, by the time you get there, you're like, ugh. And it's going to look forced and lame, and then you're probably not going to have enough speed to do it there anyways. Yeah. So and you end up kind of bashing the water with the bottom of your board and the fins right. rather than the rail through under the lip. Right. And, but you can cheat that too. So there's times to get light, and there's, time, and there's, times, to, uh, and there's times to dig in and, and, and follow through. You know, like I can come up into a section like that that's soft, get light, get over the top, turn my hips, and kick my back leg out to get the, the fins out, but that's just a technique of doing so. It's not it's not super sound. It just depends. You gotta have it all, you know, that's the thing. But you I mean, if we were talking about what you know, what you were doing, uh, what, and what you're saying is like that's a little more technique technique savvy and then once you have that you should move on to some other stuff, you know. Once you have that you can kinda do whatever. So that you mentioned that when Dane's coming coming off the bottom and, and you you get that moment where you're weightless, just before you change direction. Yeah. So like after he loads up, he's feeling he's feeling G's right, and as he fills those G's, that come up to almost flat to transitions where you're gonna feel that weightless before you whoo, and you feel those G's again, yeah. right? But you wanna st- you don't wanna be too extended when you're weightless. That was my habit. Like my body was like straight. Yeah. You you open up and you're also letting your 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 arms supinate. Yeah. For those people that that can't see us you know like if you were to say like oh i don't know when your hands go up that's like supination like you're opening up right um or, or yeah supination so you roll out like that you don't want to do that you want to stay fairly you know almost like almost how you wouldn't like in gait almost like when you're walking or whatever but in that surfing position you don't want to be open up you're letting your back arm circumduct and supinate as so open up you know and to supinate is to accelerate but you got to do it properly yeah well, the reason I mention it is it's, it's again it's something I see with a lot of just everyday surfers is they're they're overextending off their bottom turn and that through that weightless part they're not compressed in their stance ready for the change of direction that only happens as they go into it and that's part of the reason why they lose speed too so it comes back to what you were saying is like you've got to be strong in that lower position yeah so you come off the bottom you'd want to be here and then yeah you want to get that push but you want to go right back but into see this. where you are now you're where you want to stay. Most people, instead of being here, they'll be like here. Yeah. Well, and that, then they've got to drop into it. Then they, then they, yeah. So that's that's where you see those the segmental things. Exactly. So you're gonna see. You want to have you know somewhat seamless surfing. I mean, again, I'm not I'm not seamless at all, but I can see it really well. You know, with some work, dedication, maybe my brother can help me out. But it's hard, man. It's like when I get into bigger stuff, like bigger surf, where you gotta wait off the bottom and all that stuff. That's where I should fall apart. Interesting. That's where I. That's where I'm better, actually. Yeah. See, that's. I, I bet. have more time to. Yeah. No, I'm like, oh man, I'm down here for a long time. <laughs> okay, I should be up in that lip. But then you got to look at like John John, where John John. Look at Margaret's. He was bottom turning like mid face. You know, everyone's like, oh, bottom turning this that. Dude, John John was bottom turning in the meat. Like when those bigger waves, the bigger softer waves, sunset and all that stuff. You want to bottom turn mid face. You got to the bottom in the flats, and you got to climb a freaking mountain to get back up there. So, remember he was like snowboarding at yeah. Margaret's because yeah. he was bottom turning like three quarters of the way down, half the way down, and just getting that crazy top turn. So, depends on that that give and take. Yeah. Where Joan John, you know, isn't the most sound technical surfer you would think, right? Like, I, I I've never I've known John John since he was a little kid, and his mom Alex, and all that stuff. But, but um. No, I mean, no doubt is he not the craziest surfer out there. Um, but you, I don't know if you'd say he's technically sound. I don't know. Would you? I mean, it's no, kind of I mean, hard. It's kind of hard not to say that he isn't. But I've thought about this a lot, and ha- I've had clients because I always sort of, I always said to clients, "Hey, watch Julian Wilson, watch Mick Fanning, watch Joel Parkinson for good technique." Don't. Uh, John John's your favorite surfer. I get yeah. it. Yeah, it's but almost you, uh, unrealistic. Like Dane, you know, Dane. Dane, you could learn a little bit more from. Yeah. John John, not so much. Yeah, I was. My theory is that John John's doing all of the movements that that just take Mick for example, because he's so exaggerated with his wingspan and what he does, right? Torque. John John's doing all that stuff, but instead of doing it here, 
He's doing it here. Yeah, he's a, he's like a, he's like a snowboarder. It's more subtle. His, right. He's doing the same movements. He's just his timing's a little better, and his, he gets away with being more subtle. He's got a cra- he's got some crazy stuff that he does. But yeah, you're right. He keeps his hands down, and it's funny because I always tell my guys like, all right, elbow by your ear, and you know, for your back arm and your front arm, like mirror 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 your uh, your front thigh. Um, but I have a kid from Finland right now that's getting good and he's got the you know we're, you're talking about what I look for in kids he's got the fire like he'll go out there and just you know be on it trying to be on every wave and uh, just destroy it, but he keeps his hands down and I've been like dude keep your hands up he's like I can't do anything like that and then you know what he's coming together with his hands I, I'm telling him to keep his hands up but he's he's coming together with his hands down he surfs a lot like John John actually in that sense this kid Ellie Tim Perry um but yeah, he's a he's a, he's a Finnish uh, citizen, so maybe uh, maybe Olympics, something like that one cool. day. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, and I've always thought John John just had more of. Um, okay, imagine someone walking a tightrope, right? Or even if you start walking tightropes, you you're going to be like this, right? Yeah. Because you've got more control. Yeah. And you've got see, see what would John John do on that? John John. <laughs> well, once John John got good, he'd be he'd be doing those same. Weight shifts, but he's doing it with smaller movements and is he in a more yeah, relaxed smaller position. Because if your hands are that close to your body, you don't have any leverage. No, but <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I, 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 get, I get it. it. I, I get if you don't need it, you don't need it. Because yeah. I, I think John John is he's like sprinting on ice. It's almost like he's going so fast and he's so on point that he doesn't need those big movements. Yeah, you know, and well, the thing is too, it's like you don't like you were saying. Look at like. Julian Wilson. I mean, that guy's got the perfect spine position and everything. And you know, he's a more of a front-footed or a neutral-footed surfer. Joel Parkinson's a back-footed surfer, and that's a weird topic too. Like on that stuff. Like so, John John kind of stands straight up, and then he'll drop that back leg, and then he when he does those hooks, he does like a crazy wheelie out of them, which is trippy, but comes out with speed. So, where I would say, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Don't do it unless you do it. I don't know. If you can get away with it, that's cool. But for my guys, I'm like, dude, let's, let's stay like somewhat traditional, and then you find yourself. You know, once you get once you get past, when, once you get unlocked, once you get get your get out of jail free card, you're not in prison anymore. You know, with your abilities and you know physical abilities and your and your surfing IQ and all that stuff, then then we can really turn you on. Well, you have to learn the rules before you break them. Yeah, I agree. You gotta know the fundamentals before you move away from them or tweak them. Yeah, I I agree. That's right. That's what I think. If not, if not, I mean, with, with coaching, it'd be way too hard. It'd be like, all right, dude, like, okay, you have this. I mean, I'm I'm kind of gonna do it with this kid, Ellie. You know, work with his, with his John John esque style. I mean, the movements are all still there. You know, it's just like, all right, he doesn't want to keep his hands up, but we'll see. How do you define style? Ooh, you know, um. I like I like kind of like sick style. Like I I think it, like what I'd call sick is like again like Mick Fanning. That's like kind of not as perfect. You know he grew up idolizing Taylor. You know, and now they're best friends and all that stuff. But um, he has his own thing. You know he's got a kind of got a rounded back. You know he's got scoliosis I believe and um, he torques and twists and and. Uh, I don't know, just having that sick kind of predator attack is good, I think. Yeah. Being aggressive. Yeah. And and then Dane, I mean, that guy's just so fast and aggressive, it's crazy. Like, it's trippy too, because like, I'll surf with them and I know them and, you know, somewhat and, uh, you know, being from OI Ventura area. And, um, yeah, I didn't. He's kind of really mellow in the lineup, like, you know? Like, you don't see him doing all the stuff you see him do, so I'm wondering where he does all that stuff. Because <laughs> I've served with him a bunch, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, he's doing whatever. It's never like, oh. But, you know, again, I don't serve with him that much, so I'm just wondering where those, like, 20-foot backflips and stuff are happening so I can go watch. What else is happening in your world? Um, dude, I, you know, like, I was, well, I was telling you before the, this podcast started that, uh, I had some, I had three, you know, good surfers um, from Portugal come over here just to coach with me, which was, um, which was, which was rad, you know, uh, real privilege, you know, and that's rad. They found me on Instagram and 
like the program and were following it and um you know through neutrality and my my own and got to work with those guys and now they want me to go i guess uh the portuguese um you know local surfers are seeing uh johnny um rapino this kid i was sort of with like just come back from california ripping so um his dad and this other coaching company wants me to go over there um uh, with like eight americans and you know and meet up with like eight of their guys and do like a at a surf resort you know in portugal and just bring the guys together which is huge because surfing is all about meeting friends and traveling every time i went on a trip i came back better that's the best way to get better and if you go on a trip with coaches then that's the best best way to get better i yeah it's something i want to do for sure we got some other stuff in the works um we're working on a project of uh you know like a, a tv thing i can't get into too much details with but you know a little bit about that <clears throat> you know just kind of going around you know helping people in need and they're surfing you know that's really what the basis would be and then uh yeah dude just you know coaching and training getting ready for the summer i really want to implement some some new things to the neutrality uh surf academy and that's it really it's like it's for guys to stay sharp over summer and maybe you know the guys that are kind of behind the eight ball that need that need to learn heat strategy that need the video that need the camp so i'm trying to just do what australians have been doing for a long time you know i think that's where america struggles so we're working on the permits and all that stuff which are really hard to get tell listeners what neutrality is it's yeah. a facility in carl's bed yeah neutrality is just this idea i had you know i was like man you know australians have been doing this like this camaraderie of like you know mentors and and all this stuff and you know they've been kicking our asses forever <laughs> you know like they've been doing it right i mean they really care about their surfing and they have surf clubs and all this stuff and neutrality i thought would just be a a one-stop shop where you come in all eyes are on you you know every athlete is every employee's freaking case study and we discuss what what needs to happen with them physically um, with them technically and they're surfing and we hit on all those points and we help out with sponsorship and all that stuff and just teach them the ropes you know I've done a lot of, like I was saying I've done a lot of right things and I've done a lot of wrong things and hindsight's twenty twenty. so um, that mentorship and all that stuff we do a a uh, elite surf camp so it's just heats you know it's not you know it's, it's not it's, this ain't no daycare that's what it, that's kind of what I'm getting at and it's we do have this thing called um, yeah, it's a neutrally surf academy and, um, our hashtag or whatever our tag is art of elite. So really it's just like the fastest way from A to B and, uh, to reach your ceiling and to stay sharp over summer. So working on, we did it last year and it's successful. And uh, a lot of people aren't going to do junior guards this year. They're going to come down and just work hard and, uh, and, you know, hopefully show up for next, next season fired up and winning, you know, so. And we have we have Katie Simmers on the team, who is the best, thirteen year old girl. She went over for the women's ISAs in Japan and put a beating. She beat Sofina, Sofia Milanovic like multiple times, and then came back. And I think she she made round after round. She's kind of like a superstar over there. She serves so good, like better than me, right now. <laughs> Katie Simmers, follow her. She's from Oceanside. She writes for the same board company me uh, as me and my brother Chris Borst Designs. And uh, she writes for O'Neill as well. But um, I was just with uh, Chloe and Dino and his dad. And even Dino and Dino, dude, he's a tough critic. He's like, dude, that's the best girl I've ever seen ever out of all the girls at her age, you know, ever. She's gnarly. She does every verses. She does, like, solid ones. like And better rail. She rides the T1, which is more like you have to be technically a back-footed surfer and really tech-savvy. Um was my brother's model. She loves that thing. We like the T3. It's a little more user-friendly. <laughs> That's how much better she is. You know, she's crazy good. Um, but, yeah, we have her on the team. She mentioned mentioned us in uh, in Japan and then, um, you know, rocks our logos. But she came back and won the Rip Curl Grom Search. And then she won U18 ISAs, which is, you know, the American, you know, it's pretty much like Junior Olympics type stuff, right? And uh, she won that. She's only 13 years old. She won U18. She's unstoppable. Wow. Very yep. cool. Yeah, crazy. But, yeah, so just building a team and all that stuff. But, yeah, we're a one-stop shop for, for uh, you know, 
just to be the best you can be. You know, that's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to facilitate every need the athlete needs um, to be the best they can be. You know, people usually don't reach or even see their ceilings, you know. Their ceiling is where, like, your potential and your skills and everything come together with your willpower, and that's as good as you can be right there, you know. And then you can go from there, too. But a lot of people, a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys that are ripping – they're not trained and they're not, you know, they're, they're cruising. Like, I don't know. Imagine this, this, this is kind of a hard one. Imagine if Dane Reynolds trained and did all that stuff, you know, like, could he be better? I mean, he's already the best surfer in the world. He probably could be, you know, you'd have to say so, you know, if your muscles are stronger and firing faster and your mind to body is clearer, like how could you not be unless you're just like Superman, which that might be the case. So who knows? <laughs> Yeah, well, what you, I'll fill in the gaps. Like for for listeners, is when I experienced neutrality, it was we went down to the beach, we surfed, you filmed, we went back to neutrality. You've got upstairs, you've got a room to watch the footage, right? Right, and then we went downstairs and went out um, outside of the building on the concrete. With the, you got the chalk, I got the skateboard. So we're drilling technique, mm-hmm. fine tuning technique. But then in the gym, we also got the. You've got a DNS expert there who's really fine tuning just athleticism in general right right which yeah he's um, like a movement specialist movement specialist yeah. but athletic positional specialist strength training specialist mm-hmm. it's such a good compliment those surf coaching drilling the skateboard yep. watching footage and training the strength and positions in de- all in detail though that's, that's the good the cool thing is you got the surfing and you got the detail right right Whereas Mike, your business partner, right. he's got the strength and he's got the detail right. as well. Right. So, yeah. So, what I saw in video, I mean, also, with you know, with check, check and DNS are pretty pretty similar. So, I could see the energy leaks and all that stuff, right? But I'm so focused on coaching that my training is almost like kind of dropping down a little bit where he's just focused on the training part, you know, and he's not a surfer. But an energy leak and, and uh, anatomy and all that stuff, or kinesiology, it's all the same. Surfboard, no surfboard you know, running, dirt biking, whatever. It's all the same. It's human bodies. We haven't changed in a long, long time. Um, so, yeah, no, we'll, I'll see, you know, I, I just filmed you. I coached you there, made some adjustments, and then we watched the video. Okay, all right, this is what's going on here. So we got to keep your hips back. We got to do all this stuff. So we train you that way. So you get your nervous system wrapped around it, and then we throw you on the cardboard and then go, okay, this is how you're really going to do it. And then, and then when you brought your arm through and you kept your hips back, which you didn't want to do, you were you were accelerating out of turns, and that's what we wanted. So yeah, again, it's just a one-stop shop to to get better. You know. Cool. And how do people get in touch if they're interested? Um, you can go to neutrality. dot com. Um, my Instagram is Adam underscore Knox, and then neutrality. It's with the I. Neutrality. Um, or it's at neutrality. I'll put links. Yeah, on and my if you Instagram if you throw some links out, that'd be rad. And um, yeah, there's a number on our website's kind of dodgy. We're, on, we're working on it right now. Like I was saying, we we just get caught up in, in, in all the other stuff, the so, services. So, Insta, so Instagram might be a bit away. Yeah, Instagram, like, you can DM me um, if, you, if it has something to do with surfing. Um, but there's a number on the website that goes to our uh, – I guess he's our CEO, um, Pat, who's trying to put everything together. So if you want to work with me, you can call that number, set something up with Pat, or you can DM me. And if you're around, yeah, so we're in Carlsbad, San Diego, and uh, – yeah, I mean, if you have a goal, we can um, we can help you get there for sure. Dude, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Tell me like you're being kind. The goals you thought you'd reach, you can never find. Cause it's all work, ain't nothing free. Too bad you had to learn the expense of me. I'm tired of the lies I hear Why do you feel the need To dismiss your acts of selfishness Why can't you own up to your own greed and Nothing to lose and nothing to gain You're still right where you've always been Nothing ever seen to change Nothing to do more to be explained You get what you deserve In the end it's really all the same in you, my once long time friend, done the damage that you can 
Heavy on your head. Yeah. 